All right, good morning, everyone. I knew we were going to start a few minutes late. So we were trying to start by 9.15, and it's 9.14, so yay. Oh, it's 9.15, on time, sort of. <laughs> All right, welcome. Welcome, welcome to the 2018 Collaborative Journalism Summit. I am Stephanie Murray. I'm the director of the Center for Cooperative Media here at Montclair State University. Um, it's a beautiful day. I'm so glad you all made the trip um, out here to Montclair. I hope everyone's travels were smooth, um, although I know some of yours weren't, <laughs> and I'm sorry about that. Um, so we're going to get started um, in just a couple of moments. Um, we have a very packed morning. Before we get into the program, I just want to take care of a few housekeeping items um, so that everyone knows some of the very important things. The bathrooms <laughs> first. So we have bathrooms on every floor here. So you are in the new School Communication Media Building in Montclair State. We just opened this building last fall. We're very proud of it. It is a state-of-the-art facility. Um, and during lunchtime, we will have staffers and faculty who will be here giving tours of the building. We have four broadcast studios, including a 4K studio. We have a full radio station. We have a film screening room. We have this beautiful presentation hall. We have a Foley stage and much more. So um, I hope that you get to enjoy the building and check it out sometime today. Um, and so there are three levels to the building. We're going to mostly be on the main floor today in the presentation hall. We'll be in here for the morning sessions. The workshops um, before and after lunch are in different classrooms. Those are all in your program. There's one classroom that's downstairs, one classroom that's on the main floor, and one classroom that's upstairs. There are elevators back by um, where the food was this morning. Um, also, there are breakout rooms on the first and second floor. For, so those of you who have some work to do, you need to take a private call, or maybe you just want to have a meeting about a collaborative project, hopefully with a few folks, you need a quiet space, feel free to use any of the team rooms that you see on the first or the second floor. Those are all reserved and open to us this morning. Um, just so you also know, we are live streaming. We're going to be live streaming this morning and live streaming the keynotes this afternoon as well. Collaborativejournalism.org slash live stream is how you can share it if you'd like to share it on social media. Our hashtag is CollabJ, so please share what you're hearing on social media um, and use that hashtag for us. What else? Let's see. So our students are wearing red shirts. So we have students here today from Montclair State University. Even though their classes ended on Wednesday, they're still here to help with the conference. We also have students from NJIT and a student from Drew University here today helping. Um, many of them are wearing red shirts, so if you need any help, if there's anything you have questions about, feel free to ask one of our students. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. That's Joe Amditas. <laughs> He's the associate director here at the center. So um, on to the program. So before um, I turn the stage over, I do want to thank our sponsors. Um, we are a grant-funded program, the Center for Cooperative Media at Montclair State. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about us in a few moments. Um, so financial support from our funders and our sponsors is so critical because we start with a budget of zero and try to make events like this happen to help better the industry. And so I want to especially thank Democracy Fund, Knight Foundation, and Rita Allen Foundation for being our presenting sponsors. Um, they jumped right in when I asked them if they could help me do this summit for a second year, and I'm really thankful for that because it's their financial support and also their planning support that helped bring many of you here and helped um, inspire some of the keynotes and some of the workshops that we have today. So I'm very thankful for that. Um, we also have several other sponsors that I was grateful to see them join us this year, the JSK Journalism Fellowships at Stanford, American Press Institute, the Afora Airtable, who has a table outside, um, the Melher Enterprise, which is a weekly newspaper um, on the west side of the country, is also a sponsor this year. And of course, the Dodge Foundation, um, who has been um, the key supporter of the Center for Cooperative Media for years, helping us exist day to day and year to year. And without their operational support, we would not be here. So thank you very much to the Dodge Foundation. Um, last piece of housekeeping is Wi-Fi, which is very important. I hope um, if you're not in the Wi-Fi already, um, this is how you get on, MSU Guest, and then you'll click on don't have an account and you'll register. And that's the, um, for university security, you do have to go through and tell us who you are to get on the system. So um, we were going to start this morning's sponsor welcomes. And um, I'm going to welcome in a moment up here Teresa Gorman from the Democracy Fund. 
And before Teresa takes the stage, I want to mention that um, Karen Runlet is also on her way <laughs> from Knight Foundation. She was supposed to be here this morning to welcome everyone. And she will be here um, shortly, she tells me, um, hopefully sometime early this afternoon. So we're still hoping to see Karen. And I, again, want to thank Knight Foundation for their support. They are also um, a project supporter of the center. We're working on a um, national social media for local news initiative with Knight Foundation. So we're very grateful for Knight's support. And hopefully Karen will join us later. So I'd like to welcome Teresa Gorman to the stage from Democracy Fund. Hi, everyone. Um, Wow, that's a big face there. Um, thanks for being here today. Uh, I'm Teresa, local news associate at Democracy Fund. Really glad to be here. See some familiar faces, see some new faces. Um, uh, Democracy Fund is a foundation that believes that local news is central to a healthy democracy. Um, I'm joined here at the summit by my colleague, Leah Tresty. So she'll kill me, but I'll point her out. You can find her uh, later. So happy that she's here with me today, and we're thrilled to sponsor the Collaborative Journalism Summit um, in the second year with foundations that we collaborate with often, uh, the Knight Foundation, Rita Allen F Foundation, and others. Um, thanks so much, Stephanie, Joe, Carla, Sarah, and everyone at the Center for Cooperative Media for this amazing summit. I know it's going to be great, and Montclair for hosting us in this beautiful building. Um, and since Karen... Uh, I would say donated her time to me, thanks to the flight gods. Um, I'm gonna take a few extra minutes um, and turn it over to you all. So before I say a few words about Democracy Fund and why we think collaboration is so important, I'm going to ask you for something. Uh, so can you please turn to your neighbor? Uh, I, know, I know this is terrible, hopefully everyone's had coffee. Um, turn to your neighbor, extra points if it's someone you don't know. Um, and, you know, I'm not counting. Um, share your name and one example of a collaboration. It can be informal, formal, work, not work. Maybe it's something uh, from your own life uh, that you've worked on that was successful. And this is going to be quick. Um, you have three minutes, so keep it short. Um, go. <laughs> If your neighbor hasn't talked yet, switch. <laughs> One minute warning.
And that's three minutes. Now the problem is getting you guys to stop talking. Um, maybe we'll do a little, little, what's the? Okay. Hopefully that this, this will have started the conversation. No, this is perfect collaboration. We might need collaboration to get people to stop talking now. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Everyone knows this rule, right? If you see the hand. Uh, amazing. I've been to so many conferences. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope that you feel like that wasn't enough time um, and that you want to keep talking um, because that's what today is all about. Um, so thanks for doing that. I won't ask you to share your failures, although I think that's also really important to share. Uh, there's a lot that can be learned from those two. Uh, at, Democra at Democracy Fund, we often write and talk about collaboration uh, for local news and the benefits and challenges. We write about them in the local fix, our weekly newsletter, which is a roundup of the best writing on journalism with tools and examples for local news, which plug. You can subscribe at uh, tinyletter.com slash local fix. Um, Josh Stearns is probably writing that right now while I'm up here. Uh, so I hope you'll share also some of those examples with us um, so we can feature them there and in other ways. Um, we love to highlight amazing work you're doing. Um, so you can do that by finding me today or emailing us at localnewslab at democracyfund.org. So I hope to get lots of examples um, because it sounded like there were a lot out there because you wouldn't stop talking. Um, so in addition to a, a chance to plug our newsletter, um, we've sponsored this conference because Democracy Fund sees collaboration, not just with other newsrooms, but with our communities as vital and as key to the sustainability of local news. Through collaboration, we can bring more voices into the journalism we, we do, access new tools and expand the reach and impact of our journalism. In fact, we've collaborated with many of you as grantees, fellows, partners. We're excited to learn from you today. And I already know the audience got a lot out of last night's talk, if you were here, uh, the talk about collaborations with ethnic media. So check that out if you missed it. Uh, Daniela Gerson did an amazing job. So if you missed that, check that out. Um, and we're especially happy to be here in New Jersey, where we've collaborated with as a foundation with the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation, the Knight Foundation, the Community Foundation of New Jersey, and others um, to support local news in New Jersey. For example, th this year we launched the New Jersey Local News Lab Fund with some of our partners. The New Jersey Local News Lab Fund is a collaborative fund that supports people and organizations working towards building a more connected, collaborative, and sustainable local news in and information ecosystem here in New Jersey. So shout out to New Jersey. And as this shows, we also believe the philanthropy community needs to collaborate too, not just you all. So hopefully we can continue do, to do our best to work together with you, with other foundations, so communities have access to the audience-centered, trusted, and resilient local journalism that they need to participate in our democracy. And I hope you'll join us. Um, I hope you'll email me. I hope you'll find me in the halls. And I'll leave you just with those requests. So email me, find me. I'm so excited to meet you. And enjoy the day. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Teresa. OK, there's my big face now. So um, as I said last night during our kickoff, um, Keynote. Collaboration is really at the heart of what the Center for Cooperative Media was um, is all about and what the ideals that we were built on. So we're a grant-funded organization based at here, School of Communication and Media at Montclair State University. And our mission is to support local journalism, um, to help grow and strengthen local journalism. Um, and we do that work, especially here in New Jersey, for the benefit of residents of our state. We were built upon the ideal that working together makes us stronger than working separately and that working together in the public interest is better than working only separately in our own interests, which we think is at the heart of collaborative journalism. This is our second collaborative journalism summit, which I think I mentioned earlier. Um, in late 2016, we saw 
a need to host a convening around this topic. Um, it was at a time when there was a lot of discussion about how collaborative media was working. It's not a new phenomenon, but um, it's really been growing in popularity over the last um, five to 10 years. We also saw a need to do research and um, to share best practices and more. So for the last 18 months, we've been trying to build as best we can a program around collaborative journalism, which is why you are all here today. So this is our second Collaborative Journalism Summit. We also launched the site collaborativejournalism.org, which is a spot where we hope to continue to collect resources, best practices, um, case studies over the next year especially. We researched and published a paper that examines models of collaborative journalism. If you haven't read that yet, if you, you can go to collaborativejournalism.org slash models um, and download Sarah Stambly's full paper. Um, thanks to Rita Allen Democracy Fund, we were able to raise money to support six collaborative projects across the United States last year. And we started a newsletter, we've presented on this topic, we're starting to help um, do a lot of connecting between folks and some consulting too. Um, organizations are starting to come to us who want to know more about how collaborations work or are looking for partners. And so we've helped connect, I know some of you in this room, together to each other. Um, and most recently we started what we hope will be a very important database of collaborative projects, brand new. Um, collaborativejournalism.org slash database. Melody Kramer's been working with us on that. We've cataloged so far about 150 projects um, involving more than 1,300 newsrooms. Um, and we know there are many, many more out there. There are many more um, globally. And many of the projects in the database now are newsroom to newsroom, but we really hope to expand um, our research in this area and look more closely at collecting examples of newsroom to community, newsroom to individual collaborations, which is um, something Teresa mentioned just a couple of moments ago. So our goal is to do whatever we can to promote and support how partnerships can strengthen journalism for the benefit of communities. That's what we're trying to do. So um, today I would like to present you um, the state of collaboration. So we've put together a video, it's about a nine minute video I'm going to show that takes a look at collaborative journalism. This video looks at it mostly through the eyes of newsroom to newsroom collaboration, but near the end you'll see um, one of our speakers talk a little bit about how we think collaboration can go beyond that as well. So if our folks in the back, if you're ready, let's play the video. Over the last decade, consolidation and cost-cutting measures have resulted in dramatic losses for local journalism in all but the largest markets. At the same time, the growth of digital journalism and the digitization of information have greatly expanded the opportunities for storytelling and for reaching new audiences. As a result, the competitive landscape has shifted. No longer are most media organizations competing head-to-head -head with each other. Today, organizations compete for attention against social media platforms, gaming apps, search engines that personalize content discovery, and much more. Thus, we've seen the rise of collaborative journalism. More so over the last several years, journalism outlets are turning to collaboration as a way to share data and expertise, take advantage of digital tools, stretch their resources, and grow their audience. So when we say collaborative journalism, we're talking about journalists working across traditional boundaries and across company lines to partner with other news organizations to share story ideas, tips, leads, resources, and to ultimately develop content that otherwise they wouldn't have been able to do on their own or to have a wider audience than they wouldn't be able to have um, if they had been doing it by themselves. And today, by collaborating, we can leverage the power of many organizations to tell stories that have impact across multiple communities, and that can help solve problems. In 2018, collaborative journalism is being practiced on a scale that we think constitutes a revolution in journalism. It's evolved from experiment to common practice, and we see projects being developed all over the world that involve two organizations working together on a single topic to dozens of news organizations working across continents, on stories that are highly complex in multiple languages, long-term, and have really impactful outcomes. Collaborative projects have won multiple Pulitzer Prizes in the last few years, and recently the Online News Association added a collaboration category to its annual awards as well. And I think that shows that the industry is starting to embrace this practice, and we are continuing to see outside funding invested in collaborative journalism. 
I work at ProPublica, and when ProPublica first started, um, collaborative journalism wasn't really a thing. Um, it was uh, something that happened quite rarely, um, and only in certain special circumstances or certain commercial circumstances. Um, I remember that we were told early on uh, in our time at ProPublica that that part of our plan would never work um, and that news organizations weren't going to work with us because it was in their interest not to. Um, and that turned out not to be the case. In my 2017 report comparing models of collaborative journalism, I cataloged 44 collaborations between more than 500 newsrooms. From this deep dive into how collaborative journalism is being practiced in the field, I identified six distinct models, which are based on two variables, duration and level of integration between newsrooms. In terms of duration, projects are either temporary or ongoing. For level of integration, partners may create content separately, which is the lowest level of integration. They may co-create content, or they're highly integrated to the point where they share resources at the organizational level. And we've given each model its own distinct name to reflect these distinctions. So for example, a temporary and separate collaboration is a one-time or finite project where partners create content separately. An example of this would be the San Francisco Homeless Project, where more than 80 local news organizations came together to report on the causes of and solutions to homelessness in San Francisco. On the other end of the spectrum for finite projects are fully integrated collaborations where partners share data and resources at the organizational level. An example of this type of project would be the Panama Papers, where more than 100 media organizations around the world collaborated by using a proprietary data sharing and social network to communicate and create content. For ongoing projects, we see collaborations shift and evolve from one model to another usually based on the success they enjoy or the challenges they face. So for example, they may go from creating content separately to working together to create content, even to sharing back office services such as accounting or membership. One of the primary signifiers of successful collaborations are those that are effective and useful for all of the partners, and they're built around shared values and shared goals. Getting editorial alignment in collaborations can be a tough and messy process. Some of the most common and successful collaborations tend to be those that are formed or inspired by an upcoming event, which multiple news organizations would have covered anyway, like elections or planned protests. Some are inspired by an impending or looming crisis, inspired by a lead partner who initiates conversations among other partners about teaming up on a particular topic, some are inspired by a partner who's having trouble cracking a story on their own and needs help to do it effectively. Or inspired by a partner who brings resources to the table in terms of funding, such as a grant or other support. Now what is powerful about collaboration is that it can take many shapes and address problems that are a bit old, like how we can keep newsrooms alive so they can continue their important work, such as how Coast Alaska connected multiple newsrooms confronted with budget cuts and the threat of being shut down but through working together, they found a path forward and have remained essential to their communities through more than two decades of collaboration. And we see collaboration serving problems that are newer, like addressing the changing social challenges and institutional upheaval that we see everywhere today, and that are being covered by collaborative projects like State of Change, which connected newsrooms across the undercovered Mountain West and has since evolved and extended into additional projects in other states, and in projects like Broken Philly, which recently launched to cover economic inequality, or the Reentry Project, which covered the path from prison back into society. We see it in projects like Documenting Hate, an excellent example of a newsroom like ProPublica, using its strength to empower local newsrooms to cover an incredible gap in information around hate crime in the United States. The wall started with an idea in Phoenix, but almost immediately it became clear this idea was bigger than any one newsroom. We had reporters who knew a lot about the topic, who were ready to cover a lot of stories, but we had ambitions that were a lot bigger than that. By the time we got to the point of talking about flying a helicopter 2,000 miles along the entire border, we knew that we needed support from across our entire network. We worked with reporters and photographers, videographers, producers, editors, and other staff in every time zone in the country. 
We collaborated with outside partners to help us make the helicopter flight happen, design and envision the digital presentation, the back end of the project where we shared the work that we had done. In the final weeks before the wall was published, a group of people who were collaborating on the project met by phone and video conference every week. And it became almost like we were in the same place. In the end, we couldn't have done what we did without working together. And we realized we'd never worked together in this way before now. There's a lot that newsrooms can learn from existing collaborations, which is why in 2018, we started creating a comprehensive database of collaborative journalism projects from all around the world. The database is a resource to help newsrooms and organizations that want to collaborate, as well as those that want to better understand existing projects and learn how they've worked. Collaboration is essential to navigating that intersection of journalism, the constitutionally protected service that is necessary for a free society, and the industry of journalism that supports that work but frequently comes with traditional notions of competition. And we're experiencing an overall shift in thinking about those traditions, who can do journalism, whose voices are needed in the editorial process, and collaboration is a requisite part of how we continue to fulfill this role in society. We're fortunately seeing a lot more conversation about what does it mean to do journalism for and with communities, not just about communities. And collaboration is an essential part of that. The future of journalism is collaborative. Thank you. A round of applause for our speakers in the video, Heather and Scott and everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I hope that gives you a good grounding and a good sense of what we're talking about today, what we hope to talk about, and what we um, have seen over the last 18 months in our research is happening in our industry. Um, we will post uh, this video up on our site, and also we're pulling several of you aside over um, today to get you on camera, and we're going to release a re-edited version of this with more voices, hopefully, in the next month or so. Um, so now we're going to go on to our keynote and take a look at one of the most interesting and perhaps impactful collaborative projects um, of the last year. Um, I'm going to welcome, in just a moment, John Funabiki to the stage, who will introduce our keynote speaker. And as John is making his way up here, um, I want to ask you all to help me with something. So we are partnering with Ground Source today to take um, questions and ask you questions during some of our keynotes. Um, so this is our phone number, 201-514-5022. Take a picture of it, tweet it, write it down. For, for the Q&A afterward, we'll be taking questions by text message. But to start with, I would love if you could all text the word collab to this number and let us know if you have ever participated in an election collaboration. I know some folks in this room maybe have been part of election land and I know there are some other local collaborative efforts around elections. So for the next hour or so, we're going to talk about collaborative projects related to elections. So we wanted to find this out. So text the word collab to that number, and then it'll respond to you and ask you if you have participated in an election collaboration. After Gregor's keynote, we will um, discuss those results. You'll also get a prompt after you answer that question, um, asking if you have any questions for our panel too. So please um, text collab to 201-514-5022 and let us know if you have taken part in election collaboration. All right, John, come on up. The stage is yours. Well, good morning. Um, gosh, this, the, the view from up here is really different. It's exciting <laughs> to see you all here. I'm really excited uh, to, to be here and to do this, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to Stephanie to, oh my God. <laughs> I see what you mean when you see the big face. Okay, so I'm John Funabiki. I'm uh, executive director and founder of Renaissance Journalism. Uh, we do um, social justice journalism initiatives um, around the country. We work with journalists and news organizations um, on all sorts of issues. Um, our current collaboration, uh, one of, n of a number of projects, uh, is focused in the San Francisco Bay Area. We have about 20 news organizations involved, hopefully more, uh, and we're asking them, we're kind of challenge them, challenging them to take a big, deep look at the crisis in affordable housing, 
gentrification and displacement that's going on in the Bay Area. And I'm sure you've all heard of that problem. Um, and for those of us who live in the Bay Area, it's, it's, it's huge. Um, I was also very excited to attend last year's uh, Collaborative Journalism Summit, and it was absolutely terrific, and this one is, is just as good. Um, so Stephanie and her crew have devised a two-part session here that's going to be looking at how collaboration can help us uh, focus in on the problems that we're seeing now in elections, in misinformation, uh, uh, voter fraud, the weaponization of news and information and facts and alternative facts. Um, and, what, and I think what you also hear, how, how these kinds of projects are helping increase and build uh, public trust um, in media. Uh, you're going to get a global view in this session, um, and so hopefully you'll be able to, to uh, get some ideas to, to use it in your own, own areas um, and get some le lessons. So we're going to start with a presentation, um, uh, kind of a deep dive into France with uh, Gregory Grégoire Le, Le Marchand, and he has kindly said that I may, may refer to him as Greg. Thank you very much. Um, and he is the deputy director, uh, deputy global editor in chief and head of social networks at Agence France Press. And he led the AFP team that acted as the overall editorial newsroom for Crosscheck, uh, which, uh, ex which uh, monitored the elections um, in, in France. He's also a teacher um, at, at, uh, at the Sciences uh, Po Journalism School and is a member of the Economic Union's high level group on online disinformation. So he's going to speak uh, for a little bit about about a half an hour um, on their on their perspective and then we're going to bring on a panel of some more folks uh, who will join him. Okay. Uh, hello everyone. Thank you John. Thank you uh, Stephanie. And many thanks for the for for the invitation at the at the summit. I'm more than really happy to be to be here um, and to talk about uh, cross check. And uh, before uh, start, all my apologies for my for very very strong French accent. And I hope you'll understand everything. So, um, sorry, had a few. Problem with my notes. <laughs> Here it is, sorry. So, in January 2017, we were there. Uh, there was a global rise of disinformation since the uh, UK's Brexit and uh, US election, and you all know that very well. Um, in France, uh, we were waiting for probably the most uh, high-stakes political content in decades uh, in, in the country. There was a lot of, uh, of suspense because of the sudden and very unexpected rise of uh, Emmanuel Macron. We had also a very strong far right with uh, Marine Le Pen and the fall of the traditional political parties. We, have also, we had also a further ground for uh, disinformation. Uh, some terrorist attacks twice in Paris, then in Nice. We had uh, long-standing economic issues, uh, very strong and powerful anti-immigrant uh, discourse, and low trust in media. Uh, just to let you know, trust in French media is among the lowest in, uh, in Europe, with a 30% approval rate. A lot of people think uh, French journalists are under strong influences uh, uh, of economic and political forces. And as everywhere in the world, uh, social media use, particularly for consuming news, is constantly rising. That's why we launch a Crosscheck, a collaborative journalism project to fight disinformation in the last weeks uh, leading up to the French presidential election. I said we launched Crosscheck, but um, 
the original ID uh, did not come uh, from uh, the French journalist, but from first draft that you all may know, and uh, particularly Jenny Sargent. Because uh, there was a lot of skepticism uh, among my colleagues, even if they were uh, more than ready to collaborate. Uh, collaboration isn't natural between journalists. But Jenny Sargent was so enthusiastic and persuasive, she put so much in, so much energy that she managed to get more than 30 French media on board on this project. I really want to thank her and to underline how important it is to have a, a strong project manager, as Jenny uh, was, in that kind of project involving uh, so many people, so many uh, newsroom and, and media. And I must also uh, thank the Google News Lab in Paris, obviously, which gave us uh, facilities and notably uh, uh, financial resources to recruit some uh, interns coming uh, from uh, one of the best schools of journalism uh, in France. Things go <coughs> very quickly. Uh, you can see here the main steps of the, of the launching. Uh, we launched Crosscheck in seven weeks uh, after the first meeting where the ID emerged. Uh, the two-day boot camp in February uh, was a very, very important moment. Every newsroom sent uh, one or two journalists to the boot camp, and it gave uh, everyone, every journalist, uh, strong knowledge on verification, debunking, and fact-checking. Uh, there were a lot of people really unfamiliar uh, with the basics of uh, verification, but they learned a lot uh, with great people like, uh, maybe you know a few of them, uh, Sandra Berlet from Amnesty International, Aliom Leroy from uh, the great Bellingcat web, um, Tom Trevina, who will, who will be soon on stage with us uh, from Midden, uh, uh, Patrick Wall, uh, who is a fact checker on Channel 4 in England, uh, uh, Jenny Sargent from First Draft, and also uh, great people from uh, Google, Protangle, and, and Newsweek. And during this boot camp, uh, the people also learned, learned sorry, to know each other, and uh, that was a really good start for the, the project. Then there was a, a press conference in Paris to mark the official uh, launch, uh, and journalists were very curious about this really unidentified and uh, unique project, and uh, notably the Russian media. Uh, here on the, on the picture, you can see Jenny in red. Uh, then from left to right, Adrien Seneca from uh, Le Monde, Clémence Lemestre from Les Echos, uh, the French uh, uh, daily uh, financial newspaper. Uh, Derek Thompson, who is American, but working for uh, France 24 and, uh, and myself. So that was an experiment, and we had a lot of questions. Here are, uh, on, the, on the screen grab, are uh, all the, with the logos, here are all the media, school of journalism and tech companies uh, involved in the project. Some of them are really famous, at least in France, uh, as uh, uh, IFP, uh, My Media, Agence France Press, which is, uh, if you don't know, uh, it's like the, the, the French Associated Press, but uh, uh, worldwide. We are working in uh, six languages. Uh, there was also Le Monde, which is maybe the most famous uh, uh, French uh, daily. Uh, France 24, the international uh, French TV, Libération, or uh, West France, uh, which is the biggest uh, local newspaper uh, in France. And in a very centralized country like France, it was very important to have some local media among us, because a lot of people uh, in France uh, would trust less and less media, however, are still confident in local newspaper. So it was very, very important uh, to us uh, to have some some uh, local media. But we had also some uh, small media outlets like uh, Explicit or uh, Rue 89 Bordeaux. They didn't have a lot of resources, but they were very uh, enthusiastic. So before starting, we had three big questions. First, uh, newsroom. Will they be able to support additional work? Uh, a lot of newsrooms are suffering due uh, notably to the, to the lack of uh, human resources. Journalists, will they be able to work together? Because on a daily basis, uh, journalists are in a competition. 
then uh, readers will be able to trust a new brand. Uh, no one have, uh, have ever heard about Crosscheck in France, a new brand with an English name in France. And with only 10 weeks left, <laughs> will we be able to have a, a bit of visibility in a landscape already uh, uh, fully overload of, uh, of information? Honestly speaking, I was really enthusiastic and uh, motivated. But we had all these questions. And we also knew that, uh, for example, an early mistake could have ruined the project's uh, reputation from the beginning. Uh, so this really could have been an epic fail. But fortunately, it works. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, a success. Uh, here is your screen grab uh, of the cross-check website, which was uh, uh, in French and English, uh, with one maybe of the most famous and quite sophisticated hoax that circulated during the, the campaign uh, regarding a non-existent offshore account in the Bahamas belonging to uh, 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 Emmanuel Macron, a story that we debunk uh, quickly. Sorry. And I really want to, to, to highlight one thing, to underline one thing, is that we made no mistakes. In, uh, in a project where you are uh, talking about uh, fact-checking, debunking, verification, it's important. Uh, 67 articles were published in 10 weeks uh, in French and English, even if uh, the vast majority of the audience uh, was coming from, uh, from France. And uh, so no mistakes. And as you see later, a very, very uh, positive feedback even if uh, everything was not perfect, uh, obviously. Let's talk about the, the workflow. So, uh, step one, newsroom and journalism, uh, journalism students uh, monitoring, uh, were monitoring social media to identify cases of disinformation that were starting to create a buzz or already viral. Uh, we had two two powerful uh, tools, Crunchyangle and uh, Newsweep, uh, both powerful to detect viral hoaxes, and uh, they were, yes, really useful, giving us relevant metrics, like the total amounts of uh, shares on uh, various pages and accounts, or how false stories were spreading on, on social media, how fast they were spreading. And the public had, uh, had also the opportunity to ask uh, question on the website uh, with uh, Arken, which you may know. And that gave us a strong connection with the, with the audience and also allowed us to maybe detect some more relevant and uh, original uh, stories. Step two, um, as soon as a story was uh, worth a debunk, um, the, verific uh, sorry, the verification card uh, powered by, by check allowed us to clarify, to structure, and collaborate about the verification process. Then we had some discussions and exchanges on Slack. Uh, Slack was really the place uh, for uh, collaboration, where everyone involved in the project could speak up. Uh, depending on the matters, we had sometimes very short conversations with uh, everyone agreeing, and sometimes very long debates. Uh, for days and days. We all spent a lot of uh, uh, time on, on Slack. But on that, I, I really want to underline that uh, even with dozens of uh, journalists, we never had strong disagreements with, for example, uh, someone threatening uh, to leave the, the project. Step three, when the verification process was uh, concluded, uh, journalists added their media's logo to endorse uh, a story. As you see here, there is someone from AFP on the screen grab asking uh, for endorsement from other media about uh, a story that we, we've debunked. And we needed uh, at least two endorsements to publish the story on the, on the website. Then we uh, write the story and we really insisted on short and NBA's articles giving context and background. And no judgments, nor irony, nor lessons of journalism that to the readers that could give uh, them the impression that they are dumb, uh, and, uh, and really they are not. Uh, labeling was also an important step. 
uh, as you see, there were six uh, categories here. Um, because, as you all know, oxies are not only doctored photos or fake websites, but more often misattributed or uh, out of context uh, information. In that matter, the most viral hoax was uh, a video taken out of context showing a man violently uh, eating woman that was viewed more than 15 million times and shared more than 210,000 uh, times on Facebook. Several pages uh, associated with the far right in France claim that video uh, showed a migrant assaulting nurses in an hospital in France. That was a manipulation because this video, uh, viewed on more than 15 million times, was from Novogorod in Russia and involved a drunk uh, attacking two nurses. That was not in France. Um, and in this particular example, what is interesting is that kind of uh, disinformation spreads between countries, uh, often changed or uh, adapted to fit the local context. Because after France, um, a Turkish Facebook page, for example, claimed that this video showed a Russian man uh, attacking a female doctor in an hospital in Turkey. Then in Spain, uh, some social media users, however, claimed that it was uh, a Muslim person attacking a nurse in a Spanish health center. Everything of the, every interpretation is false. That was in Russia with a drunk. Then um, final reviews uh, were made by, by, sorry, were made by my team in Paris because like in every uh, newspaper or website, you need it for the uh, global editorial coherence or, or just typos. Uh, here, there's another screen grab uh, of uh, the debunk of a uh, quite sophisticated and clever hoax uh, with a clone of a, a famous uh, Belgian daily, uh, Le Soir, uh, claiming that Emmanuel Macron's campaign was financed by Saudi Arabia, quoting an IFP story. But that was quite, quite easy to debunk because uh, this story was never write, written by uh, IFP. I highlighted here with the arrows, uh, red arrows, the, the media logos which endorse the story because uh, as we, uh, we will see later, this is uh, very important to give credibility. Uh, then, uh, last step, uh, our stories were uh, then shared multiple times on Twitter and Facebook or republished by uh, participating uh, newsrooms on their own platforms, uh, crediting uh, cross-check, of course. So now let's talk about uh, the impact of cross-check. First of all, uh, what is going to, to follow ensues from my own experience uh, during the 10 weeks of cross-check, but also from a really interesting report uh, made by three French uh, researchers, Sophie Chauvet, Nikos Smyrnaios, and Emmanuel Marty. Um, you can download this report on the, uh, for free, of course. Uh, uh, you can download this report on the First Drop uh, uh, website. So, um, it was this, a success for the participants, uh, and I can, I can assure, you, assure you, sorry, that everyone um, of them was very proud of the, of the project. Um, yeah, decisions were taken collectively. Uh, we had uh, a lot of exchanges through multiple uh, Slack channels, and as I said before, we never, uh, we never had strong disagreements, only debates, uh, with everyone benefiting from the the, the various expertise uh, available. No correction had uh, also to be issued. And even if there were uh, sometimes a bit of frustration because the publishing process was a bit slow, you know, we have to wait for the media endorsements, for example, uh, everyone agreed that cross-checking, the cross-checking process, uh, while slower than uh, uh, traditional reporting, uh, resulted in high quality journalism. Then we had open dialogue between journalists from new uh, and old media and you know you in conversation. Uh, yeah, really no, no difference uh, in the conversation between representative or small and big media or between students and professional uh, journalists. Everyone was at the same level uh, speaking very uh, freely. Uh, that improved the verification skills of the uh, uh, of the participants, 
with so much experts on the project, on, uh, uh, so much expert on verification and gifted apprentices speaking each other every day, uh, you can imagine that every participant, every participant made a lot of, uh, uh, of progress. Uh, geolocation, uh, rivers, uh, image search, both on photos and video, for example, uh, were uh, daily, daily tasks. That increased the use of uh, social tools as, such as uh, Slack, Crotangle, and uh, uh, Newsweep. Uh, from my per perspective, for example, I'm not addicted to, to Crotangle, which is free, and that is important for, for many newsrooms. And uh, yeah, um, cross-check increased uh, brand visibility with uh, logos uh, attached to uh, uh, every story. And once again, it was important to show that the project was uh, collaborative. And I like the, the, the sentence in blue um, that is printed in the report, um, like a few of them uh, you'll see in the next slides. It sums up very well my global uh, thoughts about the cross-check. We didn't mess up. Um, there was uh, another thing important. There was a, a, a great spirit of competition. I don't know if this word really exists. It's a mix of, uh, as you may get, you know, between competition and cooperation, uh, because there are no scoops in debunking, and participants were uh, under a common sense of uh, of, of uh, public service. And speaking about collaboration, this that is certainly one of our most positive uh, achievement. There was really a a global feeling that the threat of disinformation is so big and serious that we have to work together. If we allow this information uh, to spiral out of control, we will, we will be left crying as the public will no longer uh, know what is true. If people cannot trust, then democracy cannot work. And that was very important uh, in this project among all, among all the participants. And we learned also uh, from one another uh, building, yes, that's the word, uh, LC skepticism. And this is also an important point I insist on because uh, we still have to convince, to convince a lot of our colleagues that they need to learn and know the basic skills of verification. This is essential in a media ecosystem with more and more uh, sophisticated traps. Now we are talking about deep fakes. We are talking about a potential, uh, a potential infocalypse coming. And uh, recently I heard a, a senior person uh, at Facebook saying that, I'm quoting, the technology is getting so sophisticated that there is going to be video, probably by the 2020 elections, where you are not going to be able to tell if this is a real politician speaking or a fake politician speaking. I really don't know if everything of that will happen, but at least we must be aware uh, of that. That was, uh, sorry, that was also an odious uh, success. The alliance of media with news agencies, uh, well-known publications in France, local newspaper, small online media, was generally seen as very positive, reinforcing objectivity, neutrality, reliability, and efficiency. And the number of newsrooms validating a debunk was seen as a significant demonstration of credibility. We had really uh, an image of independence fostered by this unique media alliance. Uh, readers felt that Crosscheck was more independent, impartial, and credible because it included so many outlets. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> then the, the visual icons uh, was also uh, very important. Uh, we've seen them uh, before. They gave a quick understanding of the debunk. Because most of the time, the shorter the shortest, the shortest it is, the better it is. And as uh, Alexios Manzalis from the IFCN, International Fact Checking Network, said, we need to find formats for people who are bored, bored with reading long articles stuffed with uh, hyperlinks.
But even if a lot of people only read the titles, unfortunately, or do not even click on the links on the, on, on, on the tweets, you must give the right information and the sources on your articles. So we always explain the disinformation, why it's disinformation, and gave the links to verification. And the technique of explaining how a rumor of or piece of content was fact-checked or verified incre increased trust in the article, but also helped the readers learn how they could do this work themselves. Uh, now here you can see a, a few metrics of the of the uh, on social on social networks. Uh, honestly and personally, this is here my uh, my biggest frustration. Uh, there is really nothing to be ashamed uh, of, uh, but we suffered from a lack of visibility on social networks, at least at the beginning. Then the support by Facebook. Um, in the last week, uh, through uh, promotional ads, changed almost everything, really everything. But this is also a bit incomplete because uh, the newsroom partners also publish cross-checked uh, cross stories on their own websites, meaning that the, the, the reach of in each debunk uh, was really higher than that. So now how to do better uh, in the future. Um, yeah, we had very varied involvements. Uh, and frankly speaking, some participants did not fully cooperate. Uh, even among the most uh, powerful media involved in the project, uh, sometimes the, the, the lack of participation uh, was explained by uh, hierarchical pressures and rigidities in the newsrooms rather than individual journalist uh, choices. But some of the media had put their logo when we launched the project, then go away and never participated, not even once. So if we had to do it again, <laughs> we'll ask at least one fully dedicated person for a, each newsroom. Uh, we, I've talked about, about that uh, a few minutes ago, we really needed a stronger boost on social uh, networks and uh, yeah, Really, the, the, the project visibility changed significantly uh, with ad spend on, on Facebook. And we, we were talking about uh, a short format before, and we need uh, more short explanatory uh, videos. Uh, we made a few videos uh, uh, for our last events, and they all did very, very well. So more, more videos. We also need more analysis. And, uh, where are the tipping points, when and how to report. Uh, it's probably on this, uh, on this matter we had the, m the majority of our uh, discussion, uh, discussions between participants. Should we debunk or not? What to report or what to ignore? Uh, there is the, the, the threat of giving more exposure to rumors. We all know that. And this is maybe the worst uh, nightmare for, for debunkers to give additional oxygen to false information and move them out of uh, niche online communities to wider, wider audiences. We need some more evangelization also. Uh, I cannot talk for every newsroom involved in the project, but there are still so many journalists reluctant with fact-checking and especially uh, debunking. I'm here uh, at the Montclair State University, coming from France, talking to you about cross-check. Uh, but I know, for example, there are still some people in my own newsroom who think that cross-check was more uh, something like a, a, a gadget or was a bit artificial than serious journalism. It's a pity or it's a shame. <laughs> and um, yeah, one last word, but this really matters also. Uh, we that kind of project, we must diversify the topics of verification. We were very focused on, on, on politics because that was the, 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 the campaign for the, the, the French presidential election. But every time you're talking about politics, a lot of people will always see a bias uh, or a political orientation. So as we are seeking about a future, uh, future collaboration, um, we all think that we should go far beyond the politics 
and work on other hot topics uh, like health, education, or uh, environment, for, for example. Okay, 27 minutes. That's it for now. I had uh, half an hour, but let's end up with a short movie that will uh, sum, it, sum up what I've told you for uh, 27 minutes. many people the day that Trump was elected was the day people suddenly woke up to this concept of fake news. Le propre de, de, de la fake news, c'est qu'il est viral. Donc viral, c'est que ça va très vite. Ça, c'est quelque chose contre lequel les médias ont du mal à lutter. With the cross-check model, the idea was that how can collaboration power a much more effective monitoring and debunking of mis- and disinformation so that audiences can be served much more effectively. Cross-check, c'est né à Google Paris lors d'une réunion qui a eu lieu au début du mois de janvier 2017 et au cours de laquelle des journalistes ont eu le courage de s'allier pour voir quelle était la meilleure façon de lutter contre la désinformation à la veille de l'élection présidentielle. Et donc, nous allions trouver du contenu que nous pensions problématique et vérifier en utilisant une checklist systématique de vérification que tout le monde a été trained on. On a eu plus de 600 questions via le formulaire Harken du public, mais on a quand même réussi à publier 67 vérifications en, en 10 semaines. Pour moi, l'exemple phare, c'est l'information selon laquelle Emmanuel Macron aurait eu un compte offshore au Bahamas. C'est une information qui a circulé en ligne au lendemain du dernier débat de la présidentielle et qui, grâce à Crosscheck, a été rapidement vérifiée. On disposait d'outils qui nous permettaient très vite de remonter du contenu suspicieux, très partagé, très viral sur les réseaux sociaux. Google Trends a été mis à disposition des, des journalistes et des éditeurs. Un autre outil qui nous a été très utile, c'est euh, Google Reverse Image Search. Il s'agit juste de mettre une image dans la barre de recherche de Google et dans ce cas-là, Google nous montre à quel moment et dans quels articles cette image a été utilisée. The kind of content that we see do very well on social networks is often how Visuals, very emotional headlines. Je me souviens comme ça notamment euh, d'une petite vidéo prétendant que des infirmières dans un hôpital avaient été malmenées par des migrants. On s'est rendu compte, ne serait-ce qu'en écoutant la bande-son de cette vidéo, c'était du russe. Voilà l'exemple type de, de, de vidéo hautement virale, complètement fausse, sur lequel effectivement Crosscheck a travaillé et a, et a très vite euh, débunké. C'est révolutionnaire parce que c'est la première fois que euh, des rédactions qui sont normalement concurrentes ont réussi à collaborer. Il y avait un vrai sentiment d'entraide entre les journalistes, il n'y avait pas de rétention d'informations et on mettait tout au pot commun et on cédait les uns les autres. We have a model here that really could improve trust in journalism and my dream would be in five years time we have cross checks around the world monitoring this type of information the impact would be stunning all right thank you thank you Gregor. before you step away from the podium though we actually do have a couple of questions just for you that came in uh, via text from ground source so the first one is, um, tell us, did you have any difficulty making cross-check in France because Facebook and Google are funders of first draft? Did that make a difference? So, sorry, can you repeat? Did we have difficulties? Yeah, were there any issues coordinating? And this might be a question also that first draft Amy might be able to answer to. One of the questions was, um, because Google and Facebook are funders of one of the key partners, did that, did, was there any, ever any issues with journalists working with the corporations on a project like this? Uh, not so much. <laughs> no, no, no. People were aware from the beginning of the project that uh, uh, Google, uh, with the Google News Lab, and, uh, and Facebook were involved and gave a, a financial and a, a technical facilities to the project. But... Uh, no, that was not a problem, no. Honestly. Yeah. And that's maybe something we can also talk about a little later, too. Um, another question for you, Gregor. Um, trust in French media being the lowest in Europe. You mentioned that at the yeah. beginning. Is that something new, or is that a shift over time? Um, 
it's worse and worse uh, in in the in the in the in the in the past years uh, because as I as I said during uh, during my, my presentation, you know, there's a, 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 a I mean, there's a, it's not a really good climate in France. There's economics problems. There's a, a, a very strong far right, uh, also very strong far left. And the, the, the confidence is media, yeah, is going down every every year, and um, and after the um, after just before just before the presidential election, it was very 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 low. Uh, but yes, this is an old tendency. Uh, if is, is, that, is that correct uh, in France? Yeah. Great, thank you. All right, let's bring the, our panel up on stage, and um, while the panel is coming up. Um, if you, in the, if anyone in the audience has any questions, you can um, text to the ground source number, which we'll put back up on the screen. And also, um, we're going to do Q and A from the audience too, so you all have a chance to stand up in person and ask some questions in just a moment. <clears throat> Okay, so part two, and that, that, Greg, that was terrific, very good. Really learned a lot, um, and I'm anxious now to get into some more. And this is kind of going to kind of be quick. We've got about well, maybe we have more than half an hour because I think we're running ahead of time. We'll see. Um, what I'm going to ask you to do is we have uh, let's see, Tom uh, Trewinard from Nidan, right? And then we have Maria Sanchez Diaz from uh, Election Land. Um, and then we have Amy Reinhardt from First Draft. And they all have uh, experiences in dealing with elections, similar experiences. And they're going to talk a little bit about, I'm going to ask them just to have them introduce themselves a little bit more and talk a little bit about their particular experiences uh, for just about three, four minutes. Um, so then we can go straight to your questions. And uh, through this, we'll get, we're going to kind of get more of a global look at this issue and see how you folks might be able to adapt, borrow, or steal. Um, and I think uh, because Amy is from First Draft and they were a partner with the French pro uh, Project, uh, I'm going to start with Amy. Thanks. Am I on? Okay. Um, it's great to be here. I can't believe we're a year out from Crosscheck or a year and change out from Crosscheck. Um, so much has happened uh, with Crosscheck. Uh, we learned so much about collaboration. Collaborative, collaborative projects feel uh, on one day like they're going to be amazing, and then the next day they feel like they're going to compl fall completely apart. Um, and I think that's the nature of experimentation and um, trying to do something very different that uh, newsrooms haven't done in the past. Um, so with Crosscheck, what we got into was getting newsrooms together to work on something, but we also discovered that there's a point of discovery in the process of not just being reactive to uh, problematic content that's out there, but being proactive and seeing uh, the types of uh, information campaigns or disinformation campaigns that are going out and have the potential to go viral and how we can help the public understand what that means. Um, so what we do is we like to go in and build capacity in a newsroom or a country uh, in terms of giving everybody uh, skills to learn how to verify information online. So that's kind of where, where we are. We're looking at a, a project in Brazil and also in Indonesia to bring capacity into those newsrooms uh, to give them uh, new skills and to also be aware that journalists are now targets of disinformation campaigns. So um, we also work very closely with Facebook and Google on these projects. Um, with uh, Crosscheck, uh, we came up with that, or that idea in December, and we kind of needed a check cut on Monday. <laughs> so in order to get that money quickly, uh, it was really the platforms that came up and, and helped us uh, do that. They promised us uh, complete uh, autonomy when it came to editorial decisions, and they stuck by that. Um, they were also big uh, helpers in terms of promoting the project and uh, making sure that we had the resources we need uh, to get those projects done. So th um, our experience so far has been that they've been amazing partners and helpful in getting the projects done. Maybe we can go to Maria then. 
Hi, everybody. My name is Maria Sanchez, and I'm the uh, partner manager for Electionland uh, 2018. Electionland is a project, a collaborative journalism project that will cover voting access, misinformation uh, around voting, um, problems uh, that citizens have when they try to exercise their right to vote. As you might know, um, Election Land was born in 2016, the 2016 election. It was an effort that had the same goal, covering voting access, and it brought together uh, 1,100 journalists from all over the country around this topic. It was a very successful experiment, so that's uh, why we're uh, doing it again. There's going to be a couple of changes. Um, it's going to be smaller and sharper. Uh, that means that uh, we're going to have fewer journalists who are going to have access to our full data. And then we're going to have a larger cohort of people, of local journalists in areas where we think there's going to be problems. And we're going to be able to contact them during early voting and on election day and let them know that something is happening in their county in their counties or in their polling stations so they can go there report on those issues and hopefully have impact and have um, poll workers and election officials fix those problems uh, while there's still time for people to vote so that's the premise of, of the whole project very shortly explained <laughs> and have you have you chosen the news organizations and locations well, already, we, or if, if, if someone out here thinks that they're going to could have a hot spot coming up? Yeah, sure. Like, if anybody here is interested in, in, in the project, I'm, I'm going to be here the rest of the day, and you can come ask questions and talk to me. We're in the process of choosing. And also, we, we launched the project today, uh, uh, yesterday, sorry, uh, so people can go to the website and sign up to talk to us and, and we can follow up with them uh, and see what we can do together. Uh, so we're in the process of that, yeah. Great, okay. Uh, Tom? Uh, hey, everybody. Hi, everybody. Um, so uh, I work for uh, a team called Midan and we uh, were involved in election land uh, and in Crosscheck, um, which were amazing um, collaborations around elections and uh, verification, disinformation. Um, since uh, March of this year, we've been working um, on a project called Verificado in Mexico, which is a collaboration um, between 80 uh, news organizations um, who are working together both to um, tackle this problem of, of misinformation and disinformation that's being shared virally um, on uh, social networks and WhatsApp. Um, we're also going to be doing a kind of election land style uh, um, uh, efforts around election day in Mexico, which is um, uh, a really uh, key, key priority for the project. We don't know how that uh, voting process is going to be, and I think there's a lot of value in um, the election land model of uh, uh, finding that kind of stuff. Um, and we've also been fact-checking uh, uh, the, the politicians we're working with, um, uh, Animal Politico and AJ Plus Española, the, the lead partners, um, and they're amazing fact-checkers. So we've been also fact-checking the, um, uh, the candidates themselves. Um, and it's, uh, it's been kind of uh, amazing uh, six weeks of the project where we've uh, gained a really high profile in Mexico. All the candidates know who we are. Um, a lot of celebrities are kind of tweeting about us. So it's kind of uh, uh, a lot of focus on, on the work, which introduces a lot of, a lot of pressure, um, for sure. Um, but it's, uh, it's been, been, been super exciting. Um, also, just to see the, um, the collaboration on, on production, I think, which is really interesting between um, the, the Verificado team and the AJ Plus Espanol team, who've done an amazing job of, of producing the kind of uh, video content that I think Greg, Greg was talking about um, at the end there. So. Um, I know we're going to turn to questions here in a, in a sec here, but now, could you, uh, given that we had kind of a, a deep look at what's going, what happened in France, were there any big differences, uh, significant differences, or were the experiences similar? Um, I, I think similar. I think a lot of the challenges um, that Greg, Greg highlighted uh, resonate. Um, uh, I, I, the, the kind of scale and profile um, has, has gotten very, you know, very big very quickly. I think that introduces um, uh, uh, maybe a, a new kind of, of, of pressure, but um, I think there's been there's been a really great response from from the audience. You know, I think I think we have like 140,000 followers on Twitter um, after a couple of weeks, um, uh, all, all organic. So I think there's it shows that there's a real 
um, desire to learn about this stuff. Some of the content that's done really well has been um, how do you do a reverse image search on your mobile phone. There's also been kind of educational content that has been um, produced by Animal Politico with, with AJ Plus as well. Okay, thank you. So we're going to go to Stephanie. <laughs> there we go. I'm right. back. So we got a flood of questions in via text message um, when the panel was coming up. So thank you for that. We probably have at least six or seven. So we're going to go through some of those, and then I want to open it up to audience questions. So we've got plenty of time. We've got a good 30 minutes to talk together about um, these amazing projects from around the world. Um, so to start with, one of the questions that came in was, um, can you talk a little bit about how you make sure that your efforts are not perceived as siding with one candidate or another? And that's something that Gregor you know, mentioned about in one of his slides being seen as a pro Macron. Macron, I can never say that properly. Um, and, uh, so, talk to us a little bit about how you think about that and and how you work to make sure that that is not the case as best you can. Yeah, that was a problem, and we had a lot of discussions about it because, as I underlined, yeah, the most of the, the, the doxies were coming from the, the far right in front, which is called fascosphere, and they are very strong and smart on social media. They know really well how to use, to use this and how to, to create a lot of uh, virality. But um, so we were... Some days we were desperately seeking from oxys coming from the first lot, but they, they were not. They were not. So the problem is, yes, a lot of people were seeing us as uh, uh, as pro Macron because I think I, I don't have any uh, uh, precise statistics about it, but uh, I think that's at least 80 percent of the oxys were targ were targeting uh, were targeting Macron, but. I mean, we cannot say, okay, no, today we have debunked two stories about Macron, we can do not more, we need to find something about, uh, yeah. There were no, uh, for example, there were no fakes or, or false uh, or rumors about uh, Marine Le Pen uh, from the, on the far right. So that's a problem, that's a problem, yet we cannot, uh, uh <laughs> But we, we, we have to debunk every story, even if they were targeting the, the, the almost every time the same candidate. But that's why I'd say at the end, that's why we want to go further with the with the with the every every participant, and we're really thinking to go uh, to do more than than politics because we don't want to give the impression that impression of uh, of pro Macron or uh, be too to on 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 one side. Because when you're talking about climate or or education or, or stuff, uh, stuff like that, there is there is no no it's not politics really different. So, so yeah, but that was a problem. But we have to do <laughs> with it, and we cannot change. We cannot change. I mean, we yeah, that's it. Sometimes uh, we get we're just. Just talk, okay. Uh, sometimes we get accused that we are uh, dealing mostly with left-leaning news organizations. And uh, for a Brazil election project, the, the partners that we've identified, other people have said, those are right-leaning. And I was like, we've never had that problem. Um, so in some ways, it's, it's really hard to get a, um, a good uh, array of partners because all the partners, if they're going to work together, have to trust one another. And if there's, if there's a very polarizing news organization, um, that you know, it's hard to get work done. It's hard to get trust built in that. But I think it also do, also speaks to the importance of having a diverse representation of information because what one person sees online and considers dis disinformation is what somebody else uh, would see um, in the, in what they're looking for too. I'm not sure if that's so much a problem for election land since it's a project about a voting access and voting rights. And that should be a topic that goes beyond party lines, although there is a little bit of um, partisan uh, debate around voter fraud um, and that kind of stuff, as probably you know. Um, so, but of course, um, we want to make sure that we incorporate uh, a very diverse pool of uh, partners uh, and that means from every possible uh, perspective, uh, ideologically, uh, but also to make sure that we incorporate 
uh, Hispanic media, uh, ethnic media, and, and media outlets uh, that represent communities that are not so heard normally on the mainstream media. Good point. Um, yeah, I, I think we have exactly the same challenges as Crosscheck in Mexico, where um, uh, face a lot of attacks for, for um, perceived uh, pro Lopez Obrador, who is a, the left wing candidate who is, um, you know, most commonly attacked. There's a lot of uh, uh, fake content and misinformation, disinformation shared about it. Um, and so I, th I think, um, yeah, we've we've tried to kind of diversify a little bit of, of what we're working on. So looking at um, the fact that Mexico has one of the most advanced kind of uh, social media manipulation uh, mechanisms. Um, we've done some analysis of how uh, bots are trending hashtags related to the elections. So it's, again, kind of not something that's pro one candidate or about a candidate necessarily, but it's more about the information ecosystem. Um, and I think uh, building a broad coalition of partners, we have um, really a wide range of uh, uh, kind of independent and uh, local media, but also some of the big, big national media that doesn't just bring a kind of political balance, but also gives a lot of um, uh, uh, exposure to kind of the audiences that wouldn't otherwise see the stuff you're doing. There's a risk, I think, if you are just um, uh, kind of uh, leftish, independent media that you're going to be talking to the people who already know this stuff. And you, if you want to really have impact in terms of debunks and making sure that um, there's a higher quality of information, you need to, you need to kind of work with people who. Um, have different audiences, might have different views. Uh, did, um, separate from the project, investigating the uh, the far right or other political groups that are weaponizing uh, uh, election news or, or uh, misinformation, does doing an investigation and publishing that investigation help to mollify the criticism that you might be leaning one way or the other? Does that make sense? Please, sorry. <laughs> I so, so I'm wondering if, 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 if you're receiving complaints that you're being perceived as being uh, uh, partisan, does it simply exposing the fact that it is the far right, it, uh, is the main culprit of, of, the, of using misinformation to try to, to uh, uh, inflame political views? I don't think that we said that um, this was coming from the far right or from the far left. Um, there's a protocol with verification that is very transparent on the website, and I think that that transparency does build trust with readers. Um, that's the aim of it. Um, it also sharpens other skills. The point of the cross-check was that one uh, journalist would uh, do a check on a piece of content, and then two other journalists would go through those same methods, and if they arrived at the same conclusion, then their logo, they would apply their logo to it. So everything that was published to the website had to have three newsrooms um, and an editor look over it. So, um, you know, it wasn't only until after the election. I mean, you can see in real time, oh, there seems to be a lot of problematic content around Macron, but uh, you, we couldn't really draw an analysis until afterward where it's like, oh my gosh, that whole Twitter bubble is right here and it's infecting uh, this one particular point of view. I, I think that one of the things that helps um, address this a little bit and has been built into all of these projects really has been making sure that the audience has a way to, to reach out to you and contact you and ask you questions, um, whether it's using Harkin or um, uh, uh, Slide Door, Screen Door? Screen door. Um, we we have a WhatsApp channel and a hashtag that is you know we want you to verify. So making sure that um, you, you you're kind of open to receive requests to verify from across across the spectrum is one way that we've uh, dealt with this. Just to add one thing, the problem in in cross check when the, that was the the, the ID uh, emerged that the, the 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 conservative media in France were not interested in the project. I don't know why, but that's it. <laughs> uh, they are not really interesting in, they don't do debunking and fact checking more very uh, early. So that was, uh, that's why it was important to have local newspaper because in France, they're not seen as uh, conservative or liberal, they're seen uh, as neutral. So yeah, they, they, they don't have, uh, the, the, the local newspaper didn't have many resources to put to put on the project, but to have uh, their their help on certain topics and to have their logos on the on the project was really important to give uh, a more neutral image of the of the of the project. Mm -hmm. One other question um, that came in was talking about 
how you're tracking the audience awareness before and after projects um, and tracking the impact. And I know after Crosscheck, there was a fantastic um, research study published that showed some very tangible outcomes. So if we were to talk for a moment about that and then talk about how you measure your reach and your impact and the awareness before and after so you can judge how much of a difference it made from that perspective. Um, honestly, it, um, it, what what I what I've told is coming a lot from from uh, my own experience and also from 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 the researchers. Unfortunately, we didn't have too much time to, to measure the impact during the project because we were uh, all very involved in the in the writing in the in the in the in the, in the stories. But um, what was uh, really uh, positive that even during the project uh, in the comments you know most of the time for example where we are doing debunkings uh, uh, on, um, on on the on, on IFP uh, we have a lot of negative comments but during the cross tech project the comments were had another tone uh, really more positive I mean this is just a, a feeling but that was really different because when there is one media, it said, okay, you're saying that, you're saying it's false, so that is true because you're saying that it's uh, false. I don't know if I'm clear. <laughs> but uh, with, with all the medias, uh, all the, the media outlets involved, the, 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 the tone of the comments were, were, were really different, and we have many less <laughs> uh, insults, for example, on, 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 on social media than uh, when we are uh, alone as a, as a as, as one media on the on the on the social on social networks, so and I cannot say too much uh, about the the afterwards because um, I didn't do the, the 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 research, but really you can have a look look at it on the on the first draft website. This is this is a question that's really interesting for me and something that I hope to walk off with from this project is uh, to. I hope to come up with uh, metrics for collaborations, and I ask myself often, how do they look like? Is the likelihood that you will work again with those people? Is it the reach that you get together on the coverage? Uh, are you really making a change for the communities you're trying to serve? Are, are you solving problems for anybody? And I'm, I wonder like, how you guys think, think about those. I think in the case of election land, Mm, I see it as a project that serves voters and uh, th that goal is very specific and when you put a community, in this case voters, um, in the center of, of the project, of the design of, of, of your work, I think it makes things easier. But I'm also wondering how those things, are, how we are going to articulate them, how we're going to document them so we can measure them and say what worked, what didn't. I, yeah, I, I, I think this is on a, a, a key need for um, these projects moving forward. Um, uh, as Greg says, it's incredibly difficult to try and do this research while you're in the middle of this, uh, you know, what, what can feel sometimes like an information war. You know, it's, it's the, the Cambridge Analytica stuff came out since we started the project. It's clear that they've, you know, have been very active in Mexico. So, um, but I think I think there's definitely more uh, resources needed uh, that can be dedicated to that kind of research. Um, I suspect that uh, this center is probably one of the people that uh, who can do a lot of support there, along with First Draft. Um, we have uh, academic partners um, on on Verificado who are doing um, uh, some analysis of, of kind of discrete pieces of the um, of the project, um, s somewhat tangential to, to kind of audience impact. Um, but at the moment, we're we're using kind of uh, anecdotal, you know, lo looking at a lot of comments. Um, we're trying to use. Uh, pretty standard uh, engagement metrics, which itself is really difficult when you have 80 partners who are all publishing on their own channels. It's really hard to get a sense for um, how far one, one debunk has traveled. That's a very simple question, but it's very hard to answer on That's these projects. Fair. And actually, that is our next research project, which we hope to have something published by the end of the year looking at impact and awareness of collaborations, not election related specifically, but collaborations. So I want to, we have a bunch more questions um, via text from the live stream and from folks in the audience. But I want to offer you a chance also to take the mic. Um, Kisai is on the other side with the mic, and I'm over here. So anyone want to question? 
Right over here. Hello, good morning. Uh, thank you for coming out today. Uh, my question is focused on the distribution of your work. Uh, a lot of fake news doesn't just come through Facebook and Twitter, but I think about messaging apps like WhatsApp. So in debunking this news, what distribution systems do you use? And do you also focus on uh, messaging systems, WhatsApp, uh, Messenger, things that don't necessarily link directly back to the internet story itself? Yeah, so first drafts is really um, shifting focus considerably, especially when we deal with, uh, when we work with uh, partners in the Asia Pacific region and in uh, Central and South America where um, the uh, data is high cost. Um, they pay for text messaging, so they, um, unlike here where it's kind of wrapped in, into your entire mobile plan, so uh, they have had a high adoption of WhatsApp. We're very interested in uh, looking at and using WhatsApp to um, maybe have a, a burner phone set up so that we can have, uh, uh, create a group and invite people in there to not only receive information, but also send information back to people. But you know, how do we do that in a high adoption of social media, but low, um, low data uh, plans? And so you know, we probably won't focus uh, very much on video. Um, we'll have text messaging, and we'll really have a focus on push alerts. Uh, the Guardian uh, News Initiative has done a lot with, um, with uh, how to make the most effective push notifications, so we'll take those learnings and apply it to this, and then just research it and iterate as we go, go along. I don't know, uh, everything feels like an A-B test during a collaborative project, so it'll probably uh, be a lot of um, fits and starts, but we really do have a, a keen awareness on uh, having our debunks disseminated uh, through the web and mobile apps. Question. We're terrified of WhatsApp. <laughs> Tom, go ahead. Any questions over there? Raise your hand, and Keith, I'll bring you a mic too. This this came up when we hosted the the kind of kickoff workshop in Mexico. We we kind of um, have a participatory process for designing this kind of project, and so um, how do we deal with cadenas and these like chains that are being shared? Um, so it, it, and, and it, it's frankly a different verification process than if you're looking at a video that's being shared on Twitter, right? So um, we have a, a kind of dedicated um, uh, desk for WhatsApp that is uh, led by AJ Plus and is also with, um, we're working with a group called uh, Chicas Poderosas who are working across Latin America to um, uh, do a kind of dedicated WhatsApp projects called uh, El Poder de Elegir. Um, they have a kind of emergent methodology that um, uh, they're rolling out across uh, Colombia, Mexico, um, I think maybe Brazil, maybe uh, Venezuela. Um, so I think it, it, it's, it's a, kind of a new area for these kind of projects, but it's really important that we, we think about um, both, both involving them and also kind of designing content for, uh, for those new spaces. Hi, I'm Jim Schachter from WNYC, pleased to be part of election land um, again. Um, my impression is that in America, the data shows that most people who vote get most of their news from local TV news, and local TV news doesn't cover elections generally. Is, is there any kind of creating something for local TV news that ought to be part of initiatives like this so that we actually reach the people who vote? Great question. I don't know if I have the answer to it. Um, we want to make sure that we invite those partners on board. Um, but as people have mentioned here, local newsrooms uh, suffer from, they are like, um, they don't have like sometimes enough staff. Um, to, to devote resources in, term, in terms of attention, energy, and time of reporters to these kinds of projects that might feel like a distraction from, and, and from my experience, I, I used to work at Univision that has a big um, lo local news um, network uh, all around the country, and I know that they are running to a fire, to a child who was kidnapped. So I don't know how a project like Election Line, for, for instance, would fit in their workflows, but I think we're gonna have to be creative and have conversations with them and try to enable ways for them to participate that aren't super disruptive in, in their daily workflows that are like super full of things and crazy things, believe me. Um, I'm gonna quote re regarding local, I'm, I'm gonna quote my, my colleague, Heather. Um, it's 
we are, I'm, I'm super, I agree with her a lot with this idea of creating partnerships and not parachutes. Uh, we don't have relationships with those communities. They do, they have been working on building that trust uh, over years. So we, we need them and we're gonna try to have them on board. Um, I don't know if this answers your question slightly. <laughs> I worked on Election Land in, in 2016. I think actually one of the, the strengths of the project was the, the network of local uh, news organizations who were involved, and there was a, a dedicated team in the New York newsroom who were just um, getting on the phone with local news stories as we were finding stuff that was happening in Florida or in Texas. Um, there was a team of people who were dedicated to kind of calling the local uh, news organizations, giving them this information so that they could then pick up that story and run with it and publish. So I, I, I think uh, trying to find those those mechanisms, it's really, it's really hard to do that in real time on election day. Um, but for uh, projects like that are running in the in the lead up to elections, I think it's really important that we, you know, we build in those loops and also start thinking about the um, the different content types. So Verificado is, uh, we're about to um, put out a little um, audio hit, which is going to be um, shared to some of the, the radio partners. So we're, it's it's not just a question of um, the, the the workflow, but also the, the kind of types of content that you're making. And, uh, yeah, so also understand how they work is really important and the kinds of stories they cover. So I would say do not send tips of things that you know they're not going to work on television. So try to be mindful of the kinds of stories they they like to cover and and try to 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 create or provide content that they will be interested in. Um, I am Lisa Gross from Solutions Journalism Network. Thank you very much for this very instructive presentation. My question uh, goes to impact, uh, but not audience impact. And there was uh, some conversation about that. And Grégoire alluded uh, briefly about uh, uh, to the impact uh, on the alluded briefly to the impact on news professionals. And as you do, as you do your work, are you thinking too of measuring or getting some um, perspective on how? these new techniques or these new ways of doing journalism is impacting the news professionals? Are they getting better? Are they seeing new possibilities? Is it elevating the level of skills? Is there any um, plan to measure that or are you doing it already? For Crosscheck, we measured that and it did show uh, that it built capacity in newsrooms, uh, particularly smaller newsrooms, the Rue 98 is it, or 89 brand. Rue 89 brand, um, they were small newsrooms. They didn't have the capacity to learn how to verify, but this project helped uh, do that. Then, you know, larger organizations that don't have penetration in smaller regions also were able to get their information back from them. And I think, to going through the cross-checking process uh, does sharpen other journalist skills because they're going to be looking out at, for each other. Uh, we do, um, Gregoire mentioned that there was a two-day boot camp. We try and do boot camps before our projects begin to build trust. And part of that trust is drinking late into the evening, singing karaoke. Um, but, you know, you're never your most vulnerable person until you're trying to, you know, to crank out Linda Ronstan or something. So you have to be vulnerable so that when you are uh, talking to people about some very tough questions over Slack, which is, uh, you know, for people to communicate with that that they have that shorthand that they aren't um, trying that there's no um, misunderstanding of sarcasm or anything like that. So I think that that's our that's our greatest hope is that we walk away from a project and the newsrooms feel supported um, and that they have capacity to train others. And that's what we do when we go into a news or into a operation like this. We do ask that they continue to train. Yeah, uh, I kind of talk about the the American newsroom, for example, but uh, in France uh, and in my news own uh, newsroom, um, that was great to be in cross-check because um, we had some people who had never heard about verification, about the, yeah, as I said before, the basic skills of verification, never heard about it, didn't know anything about it, who uh, were at the boot camp, and in two days they turned into experts in, in, ver in verification. But, uh, and that means if you are a good journalist, you can be good in verification. Uh, the problem is, is there is still a lot to do. Um, uh, for example, I do a lot of trainings. In my newsroom, we are about um, 1,000 and uh, 
400 journalists in the world, uh, but there's still a lot to do. And uh, you know, I'm not uh, I'm not a specialist. I'm not a, a geek. I don't know how to code or whatever. But when I'm doing a, a training, people are saying me like, "Wow!" Like a Jedi of verification. And uh, but I'm not a Jedi. I can assure you, I, I'm just a, a journalist, and I know how to do a reverse search image. I know how to see, for example, metadata on photo. I know, you know, the, these are the basic skills. And you don't need to be a, a geek or, or a Jedi or a Jedi master. But we need to insist on that because, as I, as I underline and so, uh, a lot of uh, people have a, 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 a very high opinion of their of their job. And okay, this is not writing. This is not reporting. This is this is for gigs. This is for I don't know, this is not journalism. But I, in my own newsroom, once again, I see so many great journalists uh, sharing things on Twitter, for example, without retweeting things, without thinking, and help spreading rumors. For example, during the referendum in uh, Catalonia, in Barcelona, there were a lot of oxies, and I see really great journalists um, without thinking, retweeting fake photos out of context photos during uh, during this referendum. So uh, that's a shame. So we, we need to insist on that. But the, yes, there's a lot of work to do. But cross-check really helps us to at least to implement this and to have a, a small bunch, a group of experts. And step by step, we're evangelizing yeah? Evangelize the, the, the newsroom. I have an idea now for a new certificate, Jedi of Collaboration. <laughs> we can all earn one today. <laughs> John, you had another question. I just, and then I just wanted to flip that question a little bit, which was a terrific. Um, to what degree, how much emphasis do you place on helping the public to learn these skills? Okay, so kind of media literacy skills. Right. So we had a, um, a five-unit verification course online that we gave to all of our partners in our network. We can give access to anybody here too if they're interested. But then we made a condensed one-hour version, and that was really that is open to the public. And it's a bunch of videos that sh that kind of takes you through sort of MTV-style catfish. Does anybody know that show? That's the, these are the basics of verification, the reverse image search, and and to really scrutinize uh, information um, as a journalist would. Um, for uh, subjects that they would be interviewing in person. So it's just the same skill set that journalists have always had, but a few tools that make you feel like a Jedi Knight. Amy, one qu a question that came in I wasn't going to ask because I'm running out of time, but someone wanted to know if you could share the verification checklist that you and uh, Greg talked about earlier. Uh, absolutely. Okay. There's a, do you have a list serve going out after yep. this? Okay. okay. We'll have all kinds of information and um, skills building things, and we can also invite you to our closed Facebook group that looks um, at these kind of questions. We have. We have super Jedi Knights uh, at, at our, um, in our office that are able to um, help assess um, and, and take in questions. Awesome. So a great collaborator of ours, Mr. Gene Sahn, has a question. Uh, this might be a little uh, a hard question in the, in the sense that psychologists for years have studied how when people see something, attach onto the idea, even when they read a clear debunking of it, they still hold fast to the original idea. And I'm wondering how you take that into account into two things, both choosing which things we're going to try to debunk, and second of all, is there a maybe a psychology-informed approach to how we present it to the public that would minimize that fact? Because this is great and strong work and important work, but I worry that to some degree we're spinning wheels here. It's the head, headline writing is key to not repeat the um, the hoax or the rumor uh, in the headline. Um, but it, you're right. Once things are out, um, it's hard to take it back, and it's hard to uh, to go against your confirmation bias that you want to believe that this thing could be true about a candidate or or somebody like that. So uh, we. Our, our, my project is hoping to uh, stop some of that before it even hits the mainstream platforms. But once it's out there, uh, not repeating it, um, using the a version of the image, but that is somehow um, manipulated so it doesn't look um, exactly like the, the thing that's been circulating. You might have yeah, that, that is a tough question because we had this question all along the project. Because uh, the most common comment we had on debunks is, Okay, that was for maybe you're right, but that could happen. <laughs> okay, so that don't change anything. So when you're reading this, 
the, 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 the guy say, okay, you're right, but that could happen, so I don't change uh, my mind about this. Your question is why I am working for. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I mean, Amy was right. We, we, we're really trying to, uh, to detect before it's eating the main platforms. But that is also difficult because we have already talked about it. We have a lot of things on uh, closed messaging apps and uh, or on uh, on platforms that where journalists are not uh, um, really used to be like uh, 4chan or uh, uh, you know platform that like that, especially in France. Um, so we have to have some uh, something like deep web deep web correspondent <laughs> to to search and to try to 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 eat to eat the disinformation before it's going on the on the main platforms i i think the the research on the impact of fact checking and debunking is 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 somewhat mixed but one of the, th the things that's pretty clear um is that it really matters who you hear that information from um, and so i think one of the um, i mean there needs to be more research on this but i think the fact that verificado or crosscheck um, or election land uh, is is not uh, the bbc or is not afp or is not um, the individual organizations who are uh, who have their own uh, kind of uh, reputations and, and 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 known i think that, that that's um, one area where, where we can potentially be having 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 more impact because it's we don't come with the baggage of the organizational rep reputations. Um, certainly in Verificado, we, we've been making content that's super shareable. So then, you know, if, if you see something that's been shared by your mum, then that's again is, is going to be have a different impact on you than uh, if it's been shared via by some high profile journalist. So I think making content that's very, uh, we, we have this um, uh, idea of viralicemos la info info, la info confiable, that we have to share um, trustable information. And I think that's a really important goal. Last question, um, and then we're going to move on. Question came in um, via ground source about technology and platforms. Uh, we've touched on this a little bit. I've heard Slack mentioned. Could you briefly talk a little bit about the technology that you use to collaborate with each other? We, it would be great if we had one login and a dashboard that did everything. But <laughs> for all of our projects, there seems to be three or four or five things that are, are put together. Um, if Heather Bryant is here, I, I, yes. So Heather has built an amazing tool as well to help with that. Um, and so it, that's, that's really what's been needed. But right now we use, um, we use uh, direct pings into Slack and then uh, the journalists uh, talk about it, um, uh, talk about the debunk and work through it there. Um, I think we were using check as well for cross check. Um, and then you can already hear the logins, right? How many passwords have I just remembered? And then the fourth platform would be WordPress where we actually publish the debunk. Yeah, so um, I, I work for Media and we build Check, which is an open source tool for teams and communities to uh, find and go through a process of um, verification. It kind of provides that um, the, the the shared process against across a team of a thousand people working on election land or um, 150 on Verificado. So um, I, uh, I, I think there's more um, investment needed in, uh, in I'm going to be self-serving here, but more investment needed in, in, in tools that can support this kind of collaboration for sure. Uh, for election land, I like to think about two sets of tools. One is for partners, and Slack is going to be our main way of communicating with them. But uh, this is a project that is based on the idea of listening to people's problems, which I think is something crucial. And we want to make sure that we open every possible channel that it's available for us and that it's manageable for us. Uh, where they can talk about their problems when they are trying to vote. So we're going to have Facebook bots, we're going to have WhatsApp, we're going to have text messaging, and we're going to have um, the help of um, vote, voters' hotlines. Um, um, so that's, that's like the way I like to think about it in two ways, one for us and one for them. Well, this has been really a uh, great presentation, very inspiring and thoughtful work. Let's hope that we will um, grow more Jedi journalists and even Jedi moms, okay? So let's thank all everybody here on the panel.
Great, thank you. That was fantastic. Now I'd like to welcome um, Latea Rothmiller up to the stage, who's going to host our lightning talks. Latea is a senior until tomorrow, right? You're graduating tomorrow? Sunday? Monday. Yay, here at Montclair State. And she is going to host our lightning talk. So these, um, she will explain how they work. And if we have our lightning talk folks who can come up on this side. Hello, everyone. So um, I'm going to kick off our lightning talks, like Stephanie said, by explaining what they are. So um, our lightning talks, um, each are meant to be short. They're five minute presentations specifically about uh, collaborative projects uh, that people have done. And uh, we're going to do our best to keep these at five minutes, so just please be, mind uh, please be mindful of that. Um, if you have questions, you can catch the speakers afterwards in the lobby. So we'll have a timekeeper up front. I'm not sure who that would be, but okay. Right here, we'll have a timekeeper up front uh, giving signs for one minute left and uh, time's up. So you can look to her for that. Um, and our first talk will be by Lee Vandervu, the managing director of Investigate West, who will talk about the rattled, uh, the concussion discussion in Oregon. So welcome, Lee. Okay, so I'm gonna talk really fast because I've got five minutes. This is our project in Oregon looking at concussion in high school athletes. And we have a handful of partners in addition to these. These are the main ones. I'll talk about them in a minute. Why concussions? Um, Oregon has one of the oldest laws in the nation for concussion prevention. And what that is, is it means if a student athlete gets a concussion, they have to be medically released to return to sports to make sure that they don't risk second impact syndrome, which is uh, a second hit to the head. It can produce a traumatic brain injury or worse, it can kill you. Um, we got interested in this project because one of the partners was aware that schools were collecting these medical releases and with it a lot of data on medical release forms that was sitting in coach's office and manila folders across schools in Oregon. Nobody was collecting it, nobody was collating it or analyzing it. We wanted to know if we did that work, what would we learn? Pamplin Media Group, which is our partner, has 24 newspapers. A great number of them have sports reporters, so they had prep sports expertise. We really liked the youth engagement opportunities that were here and also thought the subject was really timely. Um, this is what our collaboration looks like. Uh, John Trog, editor at Pamplin Media Group, and I, I'm the project manager for Investigate West. We work directly together. We supervise our own reporters. I do data analysis and web production, and he does design production on the, on the print side. Our partners, we have a national radio partner in Reveal um, who's doing in, in investigation with us right now. They're not committed to doing a story in this series, but they're running alongside us. Along with the Agora Journalism Center, they're gonna do engagement strategies. Um, we started this really small because we weren't sure it would work. We did some research on the law. We did uh, some review of what data was gonna be available to us through these forms. We drafted a, a public records request sample, ran it by a lawyer, dropped it on a few schools to see what it would bring back to us, and then had some meetings about partnerships and roles. The records came back, they looked good. We were getting that information, no legal obstacles. So we hired a data analyst. We dropped 235 records requests across the state of Oregon, every public high school participating in sports. Um, we added uh, the radio partner through Reveal at that time. We got training from Solutions Journalism for our team, and we developed some cooperative branding and, and made a public announcement outreach kind of as an end run about anybody who might have privacy concern. We wanted to make really clear that we weren't asking for student information. All this information came to us redacted. We're only looking for data. Um, really soft rollout on so social media in November, October, uh, sorry, December. Um, started doing outreach to school boards and negotiation over the fees for the cost of the records, was getting tons of data back, did data entry and some fact checks. By January, um, we were reaching out to high school advisors, training some student journalists to work alongside with us. We developed two Facebook teams, uh, or Facebook groups, one just for journalists, including the student journalists and the other one for the public, launched an engagement video, added a Spanish speaking journalist and got our first round of data to the analysts. Uh, while all this is happening, we had two reporters just working side by side doing just the 10,000 foot interviews. This is, um, as we did those, we recorded some for later use in podcasts, but this is how we organize ourselves through Dropbox where we file all our transcripts and audio for our, our uh, interviews. 
We use Excel to track all of our contacts, current science, rela uh, related journalism, our own activities, and we also track story leads. Um, all that 10,000 foot interviewing gave us 61 story leads and in addition to the public records work before we even started officially reporting the project, we tag them according to topic, sport and story type. So as we develop a run sheet for what the package is gonna look like, we can sort it and come up with packages that includes a feature, a profile, a solution story, whatever we want to run week by week, we look for a nice balance. Um, February, launched the reporting, had a second team meeting. Our first data analysis was in. We were able to tell the reporters, this is what we're gonna look at, and these are the space around it. We gave them their story assignments, let them discuss any overlap while they were in the room together and they hit the ground with reporting. Somehow we did it in an hour. The last three months, we've been rolling it out. This is what it looks like for Investigate West. This is what it looks like for the Pamplin Media Group. Uh, summer, we're just gonna focus on some areas that we don't have time for while we're doing all this data collection while schools are in session. Uh, these are the tools we use, happy to talk about them later. And lessons learned. <laughs> Excel keeps me from forgetting more than I remember. I really, really mean that. We really like the way we front loaded this nice and small. Uh, learn that data is politics. Wish that we spent more time getting inside the wagons before they circled. Lesson learned, uh, have had to use a lot of political clout to shake this data loose since. The funding has been in short supply. We underestimated what this would cost. And I'm out of time, but uh, I will talk about the rest at any point. Hello. Okay. So next up, we have Rachel Glickhouse, partner manager at ProPublica, to tell us about documenting hate. Hi everyone, um, so I am the partner manager for Documenting Hate, uh, which is a collaborative project run by ProPublica to track and report on hate crimes. So this came about because after the 2016 election, we noticed an anecdotal spike in hate incidents and we wanted to look into that data and saw the data was really bad. So we decided to model it after election land as a type of distributed reporting project. So we were up and running pretty quickly, actually right after election land, and we launched in January of 2017. So the way we structure it is it's a network of newsrooms that have access to a group of, um, a, a, basically a pool of tips and documents that they can use to do their own reporting. And we have so many partner newsrooms, we have more than 140 that I don't even have time to show you all of them, but they are national, local, and ethnic newsrooms as well as college newspapers. So we ask partners not only to do their own reporting, we're giving them access to leads and tips they can use to do their own reporting, but we're also asking them for help in gathering tips. So one of the things we ask them to do is to publish a form on their site that allows us to gather tips, which I'll show you in a second. We ask them for a logo um, and to join Slack. And we also ask that they join as a newsroom and not as individuals. Um, and we do a bit of light vetting at the beginning. So this is the form um, that we ask them to embed on their site. It is a form open to the public asking people to tell us if they were a victim or witness of some sort of hate incident. Um, and this, all this flows into a central database that partners have access to. So this database has all of the tips that come in through the form, whether it's from ProPublica or from BuzzFeed or from the LA Times. And we also have tips from the Southern Poverty Law Center submission form as well. And then journalists can go into this database, which is a private database, and help us verify and report those tips out and they publish their own stories. So this is what the database looks like. It's called Landslide. Um, it's very easy to use. It's basically a big searchable list that you can search by keyword. So if you're a local reporter, you can look at incidents in your state. If you're a national reporter, you can look for patterns and trends. One of the other things we offer to partners is the public records that we've gotten back from our own reporting in-house. So we did a big investigation last year asking police for their hate crime numbers. So any records we have with that, we give out. 
We also did an uh, investigation on how police are trained on hate crimes, so any materials we got from that, we give out. Um, my colleague, Ken Schwenke, built a public news app that lets people compare what police say um, happened in their cities or counties with what they told the FBI, and it also allows you to click and get the records directly or to request them from us. So far, we've received more than 5,000 tips since we launched the project, um, and we've reported more than 120 stories between ProPublica and our partners, and we are getting close to verifying. Our, we've done more than 760, we're getting close to 800. Um, so in addition to the tips and the documents, we offer a couple of other things to partners. We have a weekly newsletter that is internal and lets people know what kind of hate incidents are happening around the country, what other partners are reporting on. Our Slack group allows people to talk to one another who are working on this beat. We help with story promotion on social and our site. And another thing that we do, which we will also be doing with Election Land, is trainings and webinars to help reporters build this beat bring in outside experts, and also to show uh, journalists how we've done our own reporting. So we use uh, Slack and email primarily as our tools, um, also to house documents. We use Muckrock for records requests, and we build our own news apps, including um, our database of tips. So what we've learned is the most productive partners are the ones who are most engaged. Um, not everyone is going to find a story when you work with this many partners, but that's okay. Um, busy news cycles are inevitable. Um, pitching can really help, but you need people who are able and willing to do the work. And my advice is to continually iterate as much as you can. Grow the offerings you have available to your partners by requesting more data, requesting more documents. Show reporters how you did your own reporting and help them so they can replicate it and do it on a local level. Um, and always go for quality rather than quantity. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Guns in America and Audion Fellowship with Jeremy Burnfield and Andy McDaniel of WAMU. At what point does the timer start? Is it when I start talking? Has it already started? Oh, it already started. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Andy McDaniel. I'm head of content at WAMU in Washington, D.C. It's the NPR station in Washington, D.C. And I'm Jeremy Bernfeld. I'm the director of collaborative reporting. I work with Andy. And it would be a stretch to call this a case study because we've only just begun. We've actually been forming the foundation for this project for almost two years. Um, and so we have much, much more to learn, which of course we'll report back. This is a project, a public media collaboration that is founded on really a single driving question, and that is when you think about guns and America, what do you think of? Do you think about a beloved uncle who you went pheasant hunting with as a, as a child? I just went turkey hunting with my dad two weeks ago. It makes me think about that. Or maybe you think about the way that you feel when you're pulled over by a cop. Maybe it's fear, maybe it's anger. Maybe you think about mass shootings. A lot of people do, especially lately. Or maybe you think about a cousin in the military, a relative, someone you worry about. The point is that what you think about when you think about guns drives your belief about guns, and your beliefs about guns are part of what has become a really divisive conversation in America, and we believe that public media can actually do something about that. Uh, it's a divided conversation about guns, what's our right, what are our rights around guns, and what's gonna keep us safe. So that's why this summer we're launching Guns and America, and we hope that this project will help Americans understand issues around guns better, and by extension, understand each other better. You know, we think that public media is pretty good at telling stories that stick with you. And so we want to kind of use those skills to tell a different kind of story about guns in American life. Um, one that is more nuanced, one that has more context, and one that focuses more on human stories. We also want to tell a lot of stories. We want to give this beat the kind of energy and attention that it definitely deserves. Ultimately, our mission is to create journalism that is empathetic and human-focused, that is surprising, that is obviously fair and accurate. 
So here's how we're going to do it. We are going to deploy 10 journalists at 10 different public media stations all across the country, and they'll focus on the role of guns in American life for two years. Um, their journalism will be via audio, social media, photography, text. We want this project to really be multi-platform at its core. And as you can see from the map, we've selected these 10 partner stations. They'll, they'll be in Connecticut, and you can talk to Jeff Cohen, who's sitting right over there. He's one of our partners. They signed the deal already, so you can talk to him now, and uh, he, you're in it now. Uh, so Connecticut in, in D.C., North Carolina, Ohio, Georgia, Missouri, Texas, Colorado, Idaho, Oregon. Uh, it's really important for us to emphasize that we want to cover the wide array of ways that guns impact us as Americans. So we want to cover the cultural significance of hunting and sports shooting. Uh, we want to cover the role of guns in homicides and suicides and mass shootings and everything kind of beyond. So we, we did something a little different with the collaborative in that we chose to base it on a fellowship across the country. Um, so essentially each of the reporters in each of the different places will be a fellow. It's a two-year fellowship and in addition to getting to do a deep dive on an incredibly difficult topic on which they'll have a lot of expertise at the end of this period, uh, they'll get all kinds of professional development and really the best digital storytelling training that we can find. Uh, so this will be a cohort of 10 fellows across the country. One of the reasons, and you can advance, that we decided to do it as a fellowship is that we don't want to do two years of reporting on a really difficult topic and then when the money dries up, just stop. We wanted to leave a model in its place and we believe this can be a model for uh, reporting on seemingly intractable issues because if there's any type of media that does a good job loosening people's beliefs, it's the kind of storytelling that keeps you fixated on a story in your driveway as public radio really does. Uh, so this is, it's supported by the Candida Fund, which is a family foundation that uh, was interested in partnering with us because they share an interest in helping people think differently about guns. You'll hear this journalism on local public radio stations. You'll hear it via national partners like NPR. We're looking, over the course of the summer, we're going to be looking for new partners across the country. And, uh, oh, I see. The, the through line really is that public media storytelling uh, is an opportunity to make seemingly immovable issues movable. So like any beat, you know, this starts with time to end the presentation, uh, which is why we'll put up this slide, because we'd love to hear from you any ideas or lessons that you've learned. We're also recruiting for our Audion fellows, so send them our way. It was that couple minutes I stole at the beginning, you know, that timer. Uh, and last but not least, we have myself and Joe M. Ditas, and we're going to uh, talk about our election night open newsroom collaboration, which we did this um, past November. So I'll go ahead and get into it. So um, in November, the School of Communication and Media, we um, broadcasted a live, completely student-run um, event um, on all of our media platforms to cover the uh, governor's election. And uh, it was fun. It was an experience. And it was also a mess, but like we planned for that. <laughs> we planned for that. Um, one of my biggest takeaways from that was that uh, as student media, we're much more powerful when we come together. And the reason I say that is because prior to us having this building, we weren't always all together, all of our student media. So I represent WMSC, which is the student radio here. And we were over in Schmidt Hall, and we also collaborated with the Montclairian, who is a student newspaper here. They were in the student center, uh, Center for Cooperative Media, where on yeah, yeah, they were like in a different building. Um, and what this building did was it put us all in the same place. So in prepping for election night, we decided to have weekly meetings. And uh, that's where we did a lot of the production here. And it was really time consuming. But the good part of it was that it put all of us students in the same place to sort of plan and put this thing together. Yeah, so uh, the project basically consisted of, uh, we had 26 different journalists and media professionals that represented uh, 22 different organizations across New Jersey that ranged from small, hyper-local, mom-and-pop shop uh, news organizations that cover their community 
uh, at a very local, hyper-local basis, all the way up to uh, NJ Spotlight, of course, one of our uh, premier partners is super active. Uh, and they created a live election results map, um, which we had our students and media professionals. We had students from NGIT, we had students from Montclair. I think we had some from uh, NJCU even stop by. Um, and they would, they would call up the county clerks, just bother the hell out of the county clerks uh, until we got the live election numbers. And um, yeah, it was, it was amazing. Some of them we had around, around the state, WMSC and some of the media, uh, campus media properties on, uh, uh, at Montclair sent uh, field reporters out and uh, tried uh, desperately to make sure that the connections worked for the, uh, for the live stream because it ended up being a, a more than two hour live broadcast. And uh, yeah, Latea was uh, on the, you were on the radio, right? You were doing the- uh, Well, I wasn't. You were doing the coverage. Yeah, I wasn't on the radio. So I ended up being, my usual place in the radio is that I host and like I'll produce some shows. So this was mainly TV oriented and I was one of the executive producers for it, which give, really gave me a, a background of what really goes into producing the show. And a lot of us were doing this for the first time. Uh, out of the three producers, one was from the Montclarian, which is print. We're working in TV. Another one was just a journalism student and um, me coming from radio. So what the experience did was it really just showed us how to uh, really run this thing. And we had to really rely on people like Joe to help us with this, uh, with this map of what's going on. That was really something that we fell back on. So um, like Taya mentioned, the planning process at the beginning was incredibly chaotic because not only did we have this going on at the same time we had our voting block project, which you've heard a little bit about so far, and there are reports about how crazy that project was. And so within that project, we also uh, collaborated with uh, student campus media here at Wire Jersey, WMSC, Carpe Diem, the Montclairian, uh, as well as the Montclair State Broadcast and Media Operations, the wonderful folks who are running the live stream today. Um, and to try to, <laughs> to, uh, to try to collaborate and figure out how we can do this on election day, get everybody here at the same time, assign everybody the roles, get a run of show ready to go, and at the same time also have people reporting and doing actual journalism in the newsroom. Um, it was insane, and it was incredibly fun. I, I sweat more than I did today. I'm actually wearing the same shirt today that I did not uh, plan that I think you can see in one of these pictures. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Yes, it's not the best, most flattering angle, but uh, it is, uh, it's a good trusty shirt. It's my event shirt. So, um, yeah, it was, it was just a great experience. And I think uh, one of the key takeaways was just, you know, you have to reduce friction uh, as much as possible. My job was to basically make sure that when people showed up and they had a place to go, they knew what to do, uh, and the students who were participating uh, had a sense of, uh, of an infrastructure that was in place so that they knew when they showed up to their, to their station, they knew that the script was already ready to go. They knew that the partners were there, ready to be interviewed. They knew that the map was working, coordinating with Colleen O'Day, who is a brilliant data journalist at NJ Spotlight, uh, and has a lot of patience uh, with everything that we were doing. And so it, I, I just, it was a great experience. We beat, uh, we didn't know that NJ.com was gonna call it three minutes after the polls closed. So we started our two hour broadcast and three minutes uh, into it, NJ.com calls it for Murphy. Uh, so we made sure we got it right though. We did the due diligence uh, and I think the AP, I don't quote me on this, I think, but the, I'm pretty sure the AP got one of the counties wrong that we had actually gotten right. So we'll hold that claim to fame. And we'll be submitting for the ONA collaboration as well, because we did win a uh, 2014 SPJ Excellence in Journalism Award uh, for a similar thing. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, right on time. Excellent. Thank you all. Thank you to Lightning Round presenters. I know five minutes is, is tough, um, but they're going to be here all afternoon. So if you have any questions, um, please grab those. Stand up. Don't leave yet. I have a few things to tell you. <clears throat> so workshops are next. So we have workshops now and after lunch. Um, these are the workshops that are coming up next. Um, one note, Nancy Solomon here from Partnering with Public Radio Stations in Room 2 2050 wants to also note that uh, ProPublica is here as well to present with her and one of the topics they'll talk about is some of their um, their collaborations together including Trump Inc. Nancy, got that in for you. So they're in 2050, that's upstairs. Um, the collaborative cross-border journalism workshop is in room 009, 0009, that is downstairs. So if you go back toward where you had breakfast, there's an elevator and a stairwell. Go down, the classroom's right there. How libraries can partner to serve community news needs in 1020. That is um, back here right by the food. It's the only classroom on this floor. And then national to local collaborations here will be in this room, presentation hall. Um, then we're going to have lunch. So lunch will be at the back. 
Um, after lunch, we will have folks out there giving building tours too. Um, lunch goes until 1.45, yes, until 1.45. Then we will reconvene for more workshops. So Solutions Journalism Network will be in here presenting Playbook for Collaboration. Managing Collaborative will be in 1020 on the first floor and Tracking Impact will be upstairs in 2050. Um, if there, we tried to make sure that lunch was, had some gluten allergy, we took care of that. There's some vegan, um, trying to make sure there's no peanuts out there. If there is for some reason nothing that you like at lunch, I want also everyone to know that there is an Aubon pan right here. Or if you just want coffee this afternoon, that's different. Or if you want a smoothie, right across the hall here, across the walkway is Aubon pan too for you. Um, so enjoy the workshops. I'm gonna go back to this slide so you know what's up next. Um, and we'll see everyone back here at three o'clock. I'm gonna get started in about two minutes. So just a heads up.
Yeah, I got one. I just Hey guys, welcome. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Eva Brandstetter. I'm a senior editor at Reveal. Um, and I'm taller than this mic and I can't figure out how to raise it, but let me know if you can't hear me. Um, I'm going to talk about a project that we um, have been working on for the last year, uh, looking into modern day redlining. And um, this is a really great model, I think, for distributing um, content from a national organization or a big project down to the local level. Um, but it's also, the point I want to make, because um, I know we have people uh, from a variety of media here, a variety of sizes of media, this is a scalable model. Um, this approach could be used uh, to take a project on a statewide level and distribute it to local partners in different areas of the state. Thank you. <laughs> okay. That was really easy. <laughs> okay. Um, and, uh, so, or a city, and to distribute uh, content to various areas of your city. So I don't want you to think um, because this is this big elaborate project that this is not a model you can use. It really is. Um, I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of this project and what we found. Mainly I want to use it as an example for how to distribute content. Uh, so the reporters on this, Aaron Glanz and Emmanuel Martinez, looked at uh, HMDA data, Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data, 31 million records uh, that covered two years of um, basically purchases or attempts to purchase um, properties by various buyers um, that were, um, but banks are required to disclose this data under uh, federal law. Um, redlining or the practice of excluding certain racial groups, ethnic groups from uh, certain neighborhoods, from buying properties in certain neighborhoods has been illegal for decades, but um, the fight to end discrimination in housing is not going well, uh, according to what we found. So uh, 61 cities across America, it's still happening. We were able to show statistically that, um, that, that this was a discrimination pattern. There, there were very um, few other logical answers for the discrimination our data found. Uh, other cities were not immune either, but we developed a metric to really look at, to try to measure this, the worst uh, offenders. Um, our first story ran February 15th, and then we had a reveal episode February 17th. And again, as I said, it's, a, it's really a model for us on how to um, take our big projects and distribute them locally. Um, I'm going to run through this, some of this very quickly. You're welcome to read the story on our website. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we basically found um, that uh, since 1977, that banks have been required by the Community Reinvestment Act to lend in low-income neighborhoods, um, but the wealth gap is getting bigger. Um, what this law did not anticipate is the influx of uh, wealthy professionals to inner cities um, and gentrification. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we found in 61 cities that people of color were more likely to be denied a home mortgage even after controlling for a host of factors including how much money they made, the size of the loan, and the neighborhood where they wanted to buy. So we equalized these factors through this data. Um, it included all kinds of places, so big cities, southern cities, and college towns. Um, community, the Community Reinvestment Act has, has failed. What we found is that since the housing crash, 98% of banks rated satisfactory or outstanding under the act. Um, and the way this happens is that banks can claim credit for lifting up low-income communities while lending almost exclusively.